so um, very, very pleased to welcome back one of our um, friends from the Playboy Film Festival, Bernard Herzog. And Harmony Corinne, am I saying that correctly, sir? Wonderful. The main thing that I got excited about is um, I'm, I'm thrilled to see anything, anybody who's coming in a movie demo, because I dedicate my life to the Marx Brothers for sure, and Harco is my favorite. In fact, I just met Arthur Marx in Glendale, so. <laughs> so this, I'm thrilled. Enjoy it. Okay. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome here for the first conversation here at the Telluride Film Festival this year. And please welcome uh, Harmony Corinne, who has shown a very bold, innovative film, Gamo, which will stir some controversy. I'm quite convinced of that. When I met uh, Harmony for the very first time, I, I was immediately stunned because he reminded me very clearly of my own beginnings. And what I mean by that is a, is a physical resemblance. And I asked Harmony immediately, that was about the first thing I wanted to know from him and I want to make it public. Uh, when I started, <laughs> I'm sorry, Harmony, but let's get into this. All right. uh, I had a great problem to start in filmmaking because, uh, mainly because of my, my youth. And in, the, in addition to that, my, pu my puberty was very late. And I, I looked like, <laughs> I, un until I was 16 or so, I looked, I looked like a, a child. And I think, Harmony, there was something similar going on with you. Yeah. Something, something very awkward. Uh, uh, yeah, I whispered it's that It's the hunchbacks who make the movies. And, and there's, yeah. a, there's a hunch that is somehow on you. Can yeah. you tell us about it? So I whispered in your ear when I was drunk. No, um, I, uh, yeah, I just, I mean, I just, I look like a kid until, I mean, I didn't really, you know, enter puberty until I was like 16, I guess. I mean, so it was kind of tragic. In that, in that. Um, I mean, just because my mind was like uh, very fast, very, and uh, I just looked like a little boy. But then, as soon as you know, as soon as I, it happened, I was it was good. But but it, yeah. but up until that point, I was really kind of. Yeah, you were somehow a little bit more lucky because you found a producer. I didn't find a producer. I was thrown out everywhere when they saw me. They said. They said, ah, the kindergarten is trying yeah, to happened. make movies yeah. nowadays. Yeah. So you found, found a producer, yeah. uh, Carrie Woods. Yeah, I was 18, and I um, <clears throat> had just got out of high school, and I, I met Larry Clark in the park in New York. Um, I grew up in Tennessee, so I, I flew to New York because I, no, I no longer wanted to live there. And uh, so I flew to my grandmother's uh, in New York, and uh, Larry was taking photos of me <coughs> one day in the park, and we started talking about films, and I wrote a screenplay for him. And then uh, when I went to California to meet agents, I guess, or whatever, um, I met Carrie, my producer, and uh, yeah, I was like a little can boy. You, can you describe the first meeting with your producer? <coughs> because <coughs> he, he seemed to have Yeah, he freaked out because here. he thought I was like, you know, a fit, you know, because I was really little then. You know, I was really much smaller. And, I seem much more childlike, maybe. And um, <coughs> so he thought I just stepped off, what did he say, like a school bus? Or, and he didn't believe it was me. And, um, and uh, you know, this is my screenplay. And, but it was good, yeah, it was, it was good, it was uh -huh. good. What did it need to, to make understood that you were the one who I actually had written the screenplays and not someone else, not your father or your grandfather? Yeah, they just knew by talking to me. I mean, I wrote it, it was obvious, you know. Yeah. No. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> <coughs> Harmony, uh, I do know very little about your upbringing, uh, your time in Tennessee, and Gamma seems to reflect uh, uh, an environment uh, with which you are very familiar. Uh, people are in the film that were your friends. Uh, as this, the town where you grew up is in the film as a background, instead of Xenia, Ohio, which was not the appropriate place, and it pretends, Nashville pretends to be Xenia. Yeah. So uh, you seem to have had very close contact with what I would call, quote unquote, white trash. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and how, how did you grow up? Uh, what sort of uh, childhood or, or youth friends did you have? 
in your in your youth? Yeah, well, it's strange because um, I never. I mean, someone asked me that when my father did, and I never really knew he would just leave for you know long periods of of time. And sometimes my mother would um, just you know disappear, so I wouldn't really speak to her. And uh, so I was really off on my own. It's not that they weren't good; they were just doing something else. And I mean, I just didn't know where they were, but I liked them when I saw them. And 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 well, recently I asked my dad, you know, what it was that. You know, well, I, I had feelings he was doing certain things at certain points, but but I wanted to know like what his profession was, and he wouldn't tell me. So I asked my mother to send up my birth certificate, um, so I could also find out my real age. Just I wanted to make sure everything was legitimate, <laughs> and um, and uh, so I just got it seriously like a month and a half ago, and it said father's occupation, and underneath it said fur trader. So, but he never, you never saw, I never him, saw him trading wear, fur. Or I never yeah. saw him wear fur, even talk about it. <laughs> but, but that's what I'm going to say. I mean, I, I don't know. maybe he's embarrassed by that. I don't know. Maybe he was scared. Yeah. Um, so, but then he'd come back and he'd have money and presents, so it was nice. But I mainly just, um, I, I just um, took, you know, my parents just let me do whatever I wanted. Mm -hmm. So a lot of those people were. Uh, that you see in the film were just kids I'd grown up with and kind of, you know, and... Uh, but Harmony, your, your father <laughs> uh, probably had a strong role in uh, introducing you to films. Oh yeah, he loved the movies. I think he loved films. Um, so, I mean, we didn't really much, um, really t uh, talk so much, so, um, but what he did do is he loved to, um, he loved movies, so, <clears throat> say, every day after school, where, um, I guess most kids would go home and do their homework. Or, or that was never like a thing for, in my family. We'd always just go to the movies. And I lived pretty close to uh, Surratt Cinema at Vanderbilt. Mm -hmm. So they always had, um, they always had like art films that would come in for like $2, you know, $2. And it would, they would change every day. The films would change every day. So I got to see things projected, which was so important because I really I think it's, uh, in order, I think for, to be a filmmaker, it's really important that you see your films um, in big instead of on, uh, on television. Um, I just think that's a problem with filmmakers today, making movies, younger filmmakers, that everything looks like, uh, looks like television. Um, it's, uh, there's no real like understanding of cinema. So anyway, so I, I learned everything by watching, every, by watching uh, films projected. That's what I learned. Um, from uh, which age on uh, did over that young, start? Yeah. I became like, my whole life was just about basically living life, like, you know, being a whatever, doing bad things, or not necessarily bad things, but <clears throat> being on my own and then being in movies, you know, um, just watching films all the time. And then I think it got really voracious when I was like uh, 16 through like 18, I watched like maybe three or four films a day, because I, I have really bad trouble sleeping. Um, I used to have this desk that I would sleep in and pull over my head. And, uh, <laughs> but um, I don't know. That was just the way. It, it, I just started loving the film. I just started loving films, and it's just I wanted to see everything. So I saw all your films when I was like uh, very young. My dad rented me your movies, and then in fact he took me in the theater to see um, uh, even Dwarf Started Small. And I said I've said it so many times, but that that film is seriously my favorite movie of all time. That and Night of the Hunter are my two favorite uh, favorite movies. When I saw that movie, I just. When I heard when I heard that girl screaming in the cave, and when I saw them crucify the monkey, I wanted to make movies. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, <coughs> but among those those films you saw, you probably uh, relatively early on you you had a certain predilection for for films, or uh, were you just voracious, uh, seeing everything that yeah. that came? It was never about for me. <coughs> it was never about like seeing movies for like um just for like the you know just for the act or just to like know like when i hear like um i'm you know, like not gonna say names or whatever but you know you hear like all people's i mean you know quentin or those guys or even scorsese who i think i admire but sometimes when i hear them talk about less less scorsese i guess but but a lot of people um when they talk about films and their film knowledge it almost seems like um baseball card collectors or something. It almost seems there's really no uh, passion or there's no, I mean, maybe there is, but you d I just don't feel, I feel like it's kind of like trivia. And I never felt like films were trivia to me. It was always like, uh, it was always a mm, really sacred place or more like a way I figured, um, I just, it was a way I understood things, a place that I you know, figured things out, I guess.
and uh, Harmony, it's obvious that you never attended film school or anything like that. Uh, I don't like that very shit. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I hate it. I mean, I think that, that ate the, it's like eating the soul of like, uh, of just like what you see now. It's all become like a process. It's all garbage. It's just like, uh, because kids are just writing to, it's just all these rich kids that were going to be doctors or whatever, now want to be filmmakers. <coughs> with no like life experience, I don't think, or very little or, and they're just kind of like writing for each other, this kind of really shitty wit that I hate. And, um, <laughs> and somehow, but I mean, it's perfect for when they go into, you know, the, to when they go to Hollywood, you know, and when they meet, and when they meet the people that, you know, finance films and the executives, I mean, that's perfect because those guys are fucked too. So it's like a, it's a perfect, like, it's just this, it's a perfect uh, relationship. And that's why films just lack any kind of, I feel like movies, I mean, that's like the track, that's like the sad thing is that I stopped going to see films. Uh, you know, the last two years, I don't even, really haven't gone to many movies because it's like, I get nothing from them. I'm just bored. There's nothing. It's like the film, you see the screen and it's dead. It's like, I just, I get sick. I, I want to kill him. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I want to make my own movies. Mm -hmm. uh, Harmony, I, I know that uh, you expressed some idea of, of getting away from writing screenplays. But uh, I had the opportunity to read four of your screenplays. And from the first page on of the first screenplay, I was struck that there was a to totally independent and new voice in writing there. I think you are what nobody here sees and what is far beyond <coughs> gummo and, and what was visible on the screen. I believe that Harmony is a great writer, a great talent as a writer. A totally new voice. You, when, when you read, for example, one page of uh, Joseph Conrad, you know immediately there is, that there is a, a great force there and a totally different vision. And uh, I, I liked your screenplays very, very much. Thank and uh, I think that's how you started. You, you started yeah. just to, to write and it somehow materialized. Yeah, that's a how part of, of you being a child uh, who still didn't have his puberty. Right. Yeah. <laughs> right. Well, the puberty thing. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. That's we'll we'll drop it from no, now. No. No. Yeah. No. Yeah. Yeah. I once I entered puberty, I started to write. Um, I was never like a writer. I was never even like a big reader. And then, but what it was was like I just, I I guess I just wanted to. The thing is, I always wanted to make films, and I and I never wanted to tell other people's stories. I was never so much concerned with, um, with what uh, other people had written. And um, I mean, I'd read books or whatever, and um, there'd be things in them that I could say relate to. But I, it still wasn't my story. So I figured that the only way for me to tell you know, my adventures or whatever, you know, to talk about my life or to make things up was to, was to write. So I sat down and wrote and started to write. And, um, no, it's a great thing. I mean, writing's mm -hmm. a great thing. I have a, I have a novel that's going to come out in April called The Crack Up at the Race Riots. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm going to just, I mean, I'm going to do everything. It's all part of, um, it's like a, this, like the whole, it goes back to like, you know, Eames or uh, Noguchi where they talk about a, this unified aesthetic where there's like, um, where there's like, um, you could say, I'll make my movies and I'll write my books and I'll, and I'll do a ballet or something like that and I'll sing opera, but it's all part of the same kind of, uh, it's all part of the same, say, vision, and there's nothing. I mean, to me, it's all the same. So, I mean, films is what I what I love. Film, film to me is the greatest art form. But I'm gonna do, you know, so much. I'm gonna write books and, you know, you know just do everything. Mm -hmm. It's gonna come out in all directions. I think. Yeah. <laughs> um, let's go a little bit more into Gamma now, uh, which um, you intended to shoot in Xenia. Uh, in the beginning, I was puzzled about it and I find it a fascinating idea to shoot a film in a, in a town that was utterly <laughs> devastated by a, by a tornado and all the people that you have in the film are somehow like, like people who were hit by a tornado. Right, right, right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I like, that's what I liked. And, and uh, I must say for me, when I saw Gamma for the first time a few weeks ago, I, I had a, a very scary vision that uh, it, it Gamma was a true science <coughs> fiction film, that Gamma was uh, portrayed a life in people that is spreading and spreading and spreading. It's not 
when, when I speak about uh, uh, science fiction, I don't see it in the way uh, like Star Wars, right, so right, where, right. where everything technical becomes more and more perfection. Right, right, right. it, it is something what is in the future. And, and I do believe that, that you have a, a scary vision of what is happening in the future, uh, a loss of, of, of soul, a loss of spirituality, and yet you, you see it with very tender eyes. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm very interesting to, interested to, to know a little bit more about this tornado stuff and about yeah. people in relation to, to a, a tornado that hit, hit them. Yeah. Yeah, well, it was basically, I mean, what it was, I mean, it starts out with the idea that I wanted to, s that again, I was like, if you look at, like, if you look at like, the history of film, and you look at, say, like, Griffith, and you yeah. look at, like, um, um, say, the films that he was doing, and early um, commercial narrative, and then you look at, like, where films are now, uh, I saw, I see so little progression, you know, in the way films are made and presented, and it's not to say that, I, that that was that's not good or whatever, but it's just that I'm so bored. I'm so bored from the, of that. I think that film is uh, it could be so much more. So I wanted to um, again. I wanted to like create like a new um, f like a like a new like viewing experience. I wanted the film to be like uh, a new kind of movie with visions coming. I mean, with uh, images coming from all directions and. Uh, so I wanted to kind of, in order for me to do that, to free me up like that, I had to kind of uh, create some kind of scenario that would allow me to, you know, to get to that point where I could just show scenes. I mean, all I care about is just scenes. I just care about just, I mean, the only thing I remember in films, I never remember plots. I can't stand plots. I don't mm -hmm. feel like there's life has any plots or it's just, I mean, I, it's, it's, there's no beginning, middle, and end, and, I, and it always upsets me when, I, when things are tied up so you know, perfectly. So I wanted to just, what I remember from films is our scenes and characters. So I, I, thought, I thought, why not just make a movie that consists entirely of, the, of that? Yeah. So, so with that idea, I, I guess I, um, I just wrote scenes down yeah. and I kind of s assembled them. And it was the idea was that it was this tornado, this town, which was yeah. true. And in Xenia, and I knew kids from Xenia, Ohio, these really messed up glue sniffer kids. And um, I, I was, I'd always really liked them. They were older. They were, they were twins, identical twins. And um, so I had this idea to set the film in Xenia. And um, in like 1974, I think it was like the worst tornado. <coughs> and they, f you know, there was like things like they were finding. Uh, you know, dogs and trees, like you know, yeah, like and the you know, cow in the electrical wires. Yeah, <laughs> and they said yeah. like playing cards went through brick walls, and like um, I spoke to this one kid who said that he knew this guy that um, was on a paper route, and uh, he was, and he was you know writing whatever, and he was throwing the papers, and he looked behind him, and there was a twist, you know, that just came out of nowhere, this twister, and it just sucked him up, and it dropped him off like 50 miles away still on his bicycle and the only <laughs> thing that, but the only thing that was wrong with him was he just had like a scratch like on his forehead or something like that yeah. but he's totally it's yeah. just like set him down yeah but the, the the tornado the tornado is 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 not is not the beginning of a plot yeah. in the classical sense right. but, but you have the guy on a on a bicycle who is right. who is lifted 15 miles right. or a cow yeah. in the in the electrical wires and babies and trees and yeah, stuff yeah, and, and, and this this kind of things and yeah. it's it's a it's a shattered right. it's 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 something that shatters all forms right. and all your screenplays not not only gummo uh, follow the same pattern or lack of pattern there yeah. is no storyline there is no development of characters right i hate as every that. yes exactly yeah. everybody yeah. Yeah. everybody in hollywood would immediately ask what uh, what is the development yeah. of the characters and, right, right, and, and, right. and things like this and where's the good guy yeah. and where's the bad guy and yeah. you have nothing of that you just are defiant yeah. you are yeah. obstinate i know i guess i'm really lucky like that too because it's like i've never um i've had a career where i've been really sheltered where the people um my producer and my um, my agents and everybody they really like they understand that I don't I have nothing see I, I have nothing to do with that world I never felt like I had any kind of um, relationship with that world and it's 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 just something I also don't uh, that I never wanted to be a part of so early on I said that I was gonna you know I was gonna make a specific a certain kind of film and I was gonna do it from a different place and if I couldn't do that then I would just quit I just wouldn't make it because to me it's it, there's 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 nothing wrong with if you can't do the kinds of work you want to do to just quit. So if I couldn't do what I wanted to do, I would have just quit. Or if I had to kind of um, if 
try to soften my vision or do anything, I would have just walked away. But somehow, I got to make these films. And that's what's so amazing is that Gummo is like a pure vision, which is so rare that, that I really wasn't, it wasn't touched. And, and especially because I'm young and it's like a, it's a new aesthetic, you know, it's mm -hmm. like a, like I said, it's like a new way to watch films. So what's up there is very important. I know so many people will hate it too, you know, yeah. definitely people will hate it, but at least what's up there, it's, it's a pure vision. And uh, I don't know, that's what, that's yeah, what, that's what intrigues me. <coughs> that all of a sudden there's, there's someone emerging who, who just follows his, his vision and, yeah. and, 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 and is unafraid. But we have to give some, some credit to the producer oh, because definitely. he's probably the boldest. Yeah, he's so the much. Boldest Carrie yeah, Woods, my sitting producer. Here. Carrie he Woods, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So he, yeah. Ca Carrie deserves the Congressional it's Medal true. of Honor it's true because for that without, one. It's true because without Carrie, he blocked me from, it, from it, everything. I didn't know, you know, I didn't know anything that's going on. I mean, I really don't know what's going on, you know. I don't, yeah. I don't, I don't know anything. Like when I watch the E! Channel and I hear those, uh, and I hear other directors talk about, you know, what they're, I have no idea. I don't even know what they're saying. So it's like, I really like, I really like it. Um, Carrie did a good job of uh, kind of blocking me yeah. away from all that shit. And, um, and basically just like letting me, you know, do my thing and work. It's very rare. It's really like, and you know, I think in a, it's like the film it shouldn't exist. This movie like almost shouldn't exist. I mean, it should, but it's like, it's the kind of film that, that it's like a miracle that it exists, especially in the, you know, climate and everything, the way other films are made and stuff. But yeah. I think it's good because I think now that, I think now people will say that, well, the, and also the most important thing is I also wanted to entertain. You know, that's like, that's the other thing. It's like, I feel like, Film should entertain. I mean, everything, art. You want to be entertained. I mean, you want to. You, things should be whatever. Um, it could be. Um, it could be new. It could be. Um, it could be like a revelation. It could be whatever. But in the end, it's still for me. It should still entertain. It should still make you. Uh, it should still make you kind of forget whatever for that time that you're watching the film. That's yeah. important. I wouldn't want it just to like shock or just to whatever, you know, educate or anything. It should entertain. That's why I like vaudeville. Yeah. What, what I like uh, about your film are little details that some are somehow sometimes are not visible for the audience. Yeah. Yesterday night, uh, Harmony whispered to me, we were sitting next to each other, that in the scene where the kid is in the bathtub <laughs> and drops his chocolate into this dirty water, just behind him on the wall there was a, a fried piece of Bacon. of bacon glued on the wall with uh, scotch tape. <laughs> Somehow, uh, it, was not, it was only visible for those who knew. Yeah, but but me, the film is, is full of such details. I mean, who is going to, yeah. who, <laughs> for God's sake, <laughs> will ever have this idea again to, to do a bathtub scene? And it, yeah. in the background, he glued it yeah. himself onto the wall, a piece of fried bacon. <laughs> so, uh, th that 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 is entertainment of the yeah, future. Yeah, I mean that's the greatest so entertainment you could have. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I mean seriously, that's all I want to see is like bacon on walls. <laughs> I mean no films, no films do that. Everybody, there's like guards and you know I, it's just there's my it's like the gummo's like t that's all it is. It's just consists of tape bacon. That's the whole film. It's just like, it's um. I just want to make a film like that, you know, where I could put bacon on the walls. Yeah. <laughs> it's, uh, yeah. Then I'm going to continue the, to the kind, the kind of environments that, uh, that you have, the interiors. The yeah. I mean, this, this whole living like in a garbage down, uh, dump. Yeah. What is very difficult uh, in, in movies is to, to create the sense of dirt. Everybody who, who is completely dirty on, on screen looks like, like well-groomed. Fake and dirt. Yeah, they yeah. Had, that's the makeup artist had fake dirt. You yeah. know, this stuff. On their fingernails. Oh, or I whatever, hated yeah. it so yeah. much. I just, but you know. don't see it, strangely enough, uh, you do not see disorder in movies. You can try to create disorder in a room and it never shows on film. It never ever shows on film. You have to toss a hand grenade into it before you, the audience gets some sense of disorder. Yeah, yeah. But in your film, there, there is the, the, the ultimate chaos. Yeah, yeah. And, and I had the feeling you, you were hoisting in garbage yeah, into right. their apartments, <laughs> but it's not so you, you took oh, yeah. some out yet. Yeah, uh, yeah, not at all. I mean, we filmed in, these, in, you know, I grew up in this town, so I knew, you know, I knew the neighborhoods, I knew people and stuff. So 
There were certain houses that were just the worst. You can't even believe, like pack rats. You can't believe that people live like this in these conditions. It's, it's unreal. Like I said, in one of the houses, I found a, a got piece of a guy's shoulder in a pillowcase. And there was just like, uh, you know, it's really, it's just terrible. And um, uh, so, yeah, I mean, we basically like, we just, I, as far as like pr um, production design went, we just shot, you know, it was more like taking things away, making things cleaner. And, you know, the, like a lot of the crew would boycott at certain points, they would refuse to um, film in these conditions. And uh, we'd, ha we'd have to buy them, we ha we have, we'd have to buy them um, like a, uh, those those white suits for like a nuclear uh, there's like a nuclear, <laughs> nuclear, nuclear, nuclear fallout and then one day you know just to make them feel stupid because I thought they were such pussies I got so angry I mean there was no there was no guts at all you know and I and I couldn't understand why I mean it was like we're talking about bugs and maybe smell I mean it was a disgusting yeah, rotting smell cockroaches behind and a, cockroaches a, a mirror uh, behind a, a, a picture on the wall yeah, yeah. but I was they're like, really there you can't exactly, plant them no everything and I was like and I but I couldn't understand why these people would be so afraid and I was like think about I get. I was like, think about what you know, what what we have access to, and I guess in the end it was like they didn't really give a shit, you know, yeah. because they, you know, it, it wasn't really important to them, to most of the crew, but um, but Jean Yves, the cinematographer, he was very, he was really fearless, and and Jean Yves and I, um, just to make them feel bad, when they were wearing their toxic outfits, we both, <laughs> I directed, I directed in a speedo and flip flops. So, the. But <coughs> yeah. how many the photos look funny. Yeah. What I what I like about the, the camera is is this is this basic physical cur curiosity when for example one of the kids removes a, a, a picture on the wall and all the cockroaches are crawling from right. under it. Uh, it's it's not a uh, it's not a zoom that zooms in from some distance. You just feel that the that the camera, ma that the, the man who holds the camera and his here wonderful handheld, he just moves in physically because he's so curious. Right. And when it comes to that, when it comes to that, that's the point where the very first cinematographer with whom I worked, he's, he said to me, Werner, move in, don't use a long lens, just move in, film knows no mercy. And that sticks in my bones until today. And, and, and you have to be bold and you have to be so curious. If yeah. the scenery is not strong enough, you just don't move in. But right. uh, and, and you don't, don't move in with a long lens and a zoom, and you don't move in with a toxic waist suit. Right, 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 right. Yeah. right. And that's what I like about uh, the cinematography. That's yeah. This is real, this is real cinema. Oh, no, no, he was amazing because there was, a, there was like a point in the film where we were shooting so much, I mean, because we didn't have tons of money and we were shooting so, I mean, I just wanted to shoot. I, was, I wanted to create, like, I don't know what other directors were, but I wanted to create this kind of like ultra chaotic environment where things were just happening and the camera could just run and we could just shoot this and shoot that without thinking about it. And then, and then in the editing, when we got to the editing process, we would make sense of that kind of chaos. And so I was giving kids cameras, Super 8 cameras, high 8 cameras. That's where all the collage, a lot of the collage stuff comes in. But, um, but Jean Yves was really um, fearless. And what happened was like they were threatening because I was shooting too much film. And I don't understand what that means. Like I didn't, when, the, when the line producers would tell me, you know, the Bond company is going to take the movie away because you're shooting twice as much. But I said, you know, but but the film is the movie. I don't. I, I couldn't even understand. I just didn't want to look at it. You know, I just, just you know. So, um, so, so there's a point where they said that if you keep shooting like this, the f that we're going to run out of money. And uh, Jean Yves said to me in the car, it was really late at night, and we were. It was nuts because we were shooting six day weeks. The whole film was done in 20 days, and uh, and um, there really wasn't much rest or time to think of what we were doing. And she said that um, he's French. So he goes, fuck these guys. He goes, we he go he goes, we will he he goes, we will fire everyone. It will be me, me, you, a fucking light bulb and a sound man. Man. And that was so punk. I got yeah. so, I was so charged. I was like, I felt like I couldn't lose, you yeah. know? I was so, <laughs> that was in, so in good. In some, we have to give him credit. In some scenes, he was all alone. You oh, were not yeah, being yeah. there when, when they destroy the table in the chair, which is, a, which yeah, one is of the most physically dangerous because he could have hit. Oh, yeah, one of the most been amazing scenes. Easily, yeah. One of the most amazing scenes is where these, uh, these guys are arm wrestling. You guys haven't seen the film, I guess. And, um, 
and some of the people had just gotten out of prison um, that day and, th and that we'd known and they were extras and kind of like I'd written the scene but I could feel that that things were gonna happen that night that were definitely like way beyond what I'd ever you know hoped for or ever even imagined and they, be they began to fight chairs and everything got really violent and there were women pre pregnant women in there that were fighting and uh, and um, but I wanted this to keep going. I wanted it to go and go and go, and uh, to see what would happen. It was also the last day of shooting. But I knew that they would, um, that they w they couldn't do that if I was there, if I was watching them, or if anyone was around. And Jean Yves and I agreed that um, in order for the scene to to really, in order for the scene to really, you know, go as far as it could go, that the only person that could be in the room, not, it couldn't even be a sound person, would be. John used a cinematographer, so they rigged a boom onto his camera, and I shut all the doors, and I broke all, the, knocked all the monitors down. So I, I, w I didn't even know what was going on. I would just run in between takes and get them really excited. You know, I'd say like, tell the guy to throw the refrigerator out the window and kick the door, and, and they then started the a fire woman, in, in doors. And they started somehow, a fight, yeah, and they're which is not they're, in the film they're now, to, yeah. yeah, they're trying to bake the chair of spaghetti. They're doing all this stuff, and um, it was just him in there by himself, like you know, with the camera. Just totally like that. Yeah. So it's just it was really amazing. It was really scary. But if you see a scene, you watch there, there's one one moment in this whole scene of violence against a chair, which I like most, is all of a sudden a moment of complete silence. Nobody knows what to do next, and nobody nobody has any idea what 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 they should do now. <laughs> oh yeah, with that. And, uh, and, and such a it. such a moment, you only capture when you, there's only one camera there, and that. A, a scene you can't direct. Oh, I know. You can't direct this moment of silence and moment of indecision. Because they didn't, yeah, because they didn't know what to. There was nothing yeah. to do, and it was like they didn't know what to do next. And it was like the father had had been beaten, and it was just this really. I mean, when I saw that, when I saw that the next day in dailies, I was just like, it was amazing to me because he captured that kind of really, like he really captured that awkwardness, yeah, yeah. that sad silence. It was beautiful. Mm -hmm. After the screening yesterday, there were some timid questions about the young kids, and, and what, what did their parents think about that? Right. And, and, and so, and, and uh, apparently the parents were all in this violent scene. Yeah. They were the ones who destroyed the Yeah, chair. most of the kids <laughs> who are in the film, their parents were in that scene, so <laughs> their, their parents were, so it kind of worked out well. <laughs> you know, <laughs> that was good. <laughs> but yeah, most of those kids I'd grown up with or gone to high school with, or you know, lots of stuff so I, that I knew or just cast from hanging out down there. Mm -hmm. Let's uh, try to talk about music, which is very hard to <laughs> verbalize. But I was struck uh, about the quality of the music, in particular as last night the sound was put up quite loud. Yeah, really loud. And it becomes very effective, and it becomes uh, like, like an additional leading character in your film. Yeah. I like the way you, you handle music, and there are very few people who know how to do that. So yeah. you come out of, of nowhere, quote unquote, yeah. which is not true because you have a lot of background already. Right. But how you handle music is something you can't teach to anyone. Right, well that goes again with the idea of what film can be. I always felt like film is, you know, it's everything. I felt if Wagner was alive, he would be not making music, he would be making films. I really he would believe have made Gummo, you think? Maybe Gummo. <laughs> <laughs> I hope not. No, no I don't think. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> but, um, but again, like the music's its own character, you know, like, so, uh, so yeah, we really, put, I put a lot of thought into that, and we used a lot of, um, the most violent music I could think of is this, uh, the most violent music I could find that I'd heard was this kind of black metal, like death metal grindcore, um, Norwegian death metal, a lot of the bands that like burn churches down and uh, mm -hmm. um, like pagan, pagan kind of uh, satanic rock, European Aryan death rock that I really like. So, mm -hmm. and a lot of the bands we actually were making their music from like German prisons. Uh, because they were in jail for like, you know, you know there's a few people in jail for murder. Um, but they were really talented musicians and they would, um, they would send us their tapes from the prison and mm -hmm. we would uh, use them in the film. Uh, speaking about leading characters, can you explain a little bit more about one or two of your leading figures in, in the film? They, they are very unusual faces, very unusual kids. And I, I immediately liked them. Yeah. Yeah, me too. I mean, I just wanted to make, I wanted to see, I mean, so much from film is like visual and, and when I go to movies, it's like, it usually there's, uh, 
anything on the screen that lacks any kind of like visual curiosity. There's no like, there's nothing up there that really compels me. So I wanted you to like, I wanted to see people that I thought were amazing looking, or people that you had never seen. And it goes with the film, things that you had never seen before. So um, I was watching an episode of Sally Jesse Raphael, and there was an episode called My Child Died from Sniffing Paint. And I saw this kid named Nick, uh, who was a Who's the one, the, the, the one with the hair? To, uh, no, the, no older the, the older one. He's yeah, a survivor. Yeah. He's a paint-sniffing survivor. <laughs> and, um, and, and I had written the script already, and I really, um, I really loved him. He was, uh, they said, where are you going to be? He was on acid on the show. Um, I, and and uh, that's what he told me later. And, um, and they said, where are you going to be in a few years? And he said, I'll probably be dead. And so, I wanted, so that's why I wanted to star in the film. That's who we, we've tracked him down. He starred in the movie. Mm -hmm. In the younger one with uh, I saw in whose a hair is uh, getting uh, shampooed in the film. Yeah, he was a uh, he had he a small part, as like a character part in this Alan Parker film that I saw, and he was also a, in, a, in a Dunkin' Donuts commercial that I liked, <laughs> and uh, so we cast him. Uh -huh. I just thought he had an amazing face. Mm -hmm. Yeah, both of them were, were not uh, childhood acquaintances of yours. Or no, neither they, one they of those. Yes, guys. Yeah. yeah, but many others were were people whom you know very well. Like the brothers who beat the beat each other up in the beginning. There's a scene where these two brothers uh, really beat each other. Like I think it's the only really true fight I could I've ever seen. I feel like a true fight from beginning until end, with no edits, like real violence. And they're just these brothers that I grew up with. They're actually sweet brothers, but they very violent kids. And uh, yeah, I mean, everything was about, for me, it's like film, the way I got these things and the way, it's all about access. It's all about trust. It's like once that people, I really feel that once that like they let your, their guard down or once they're not really, I mean, because I always, I always had trouble believing that, that there was like truth in film. I mean, we've had this yeah. discussion, um, before, like the first time we spoke, we spoke about cinema verite and the idea uh, is there such a thing as truth in film? And I never felt like there was. L and I agreed with what you're talking about, like the poetry of film. Yeah. There's poetry, but never, never truth. But I feel like it's cl like it's, you could you could sometimes get very close to the truth because the thing is, as, as as long as people are aware there's a camera in the room, there there's never real honesty. They're they're always yeah. performing. But um, if you could get them to 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 trust you and to put their guard and and to uh, if they let their guard down and they're not really performing and they just are and they're being, that's where yeah. like the magic I think comes in. That's like what all my work's about. Yeah. And there's a, a very mysterious poetry in your in your images that are inexplic in, inexplicable, but yet uh, the images that I will not forget. For example, the rabbit, the bunny kid, who is on his skateboard yeah. and and going down the hill and the camera following him. It has such such deep beauty, and all of a sudden you something emerges out of your film which I would call truth and it's it's only truth that happens in poetry yeah so one has to be very careful about the term truth well, in I like cinema. that once you talk about that you right? fabricate it somehow and, and 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 it comes along and you don't even know how it happened oh yeah no no totally I mean well I like your idea tell them about what you thought about poetry and film and and, and the idea that I mean because the first time we Werner and I have a very like the a sensibility, or the, uh, or the, or at least a, an idea, like the idea of the way film is never really honest. That there's poetry in, in cinema, but it's never a real truth. But you says, you know, yeah, you can but there is it some better. some deeper stratum of, of truth that you can try to to s uh, you you have to search for that, and and cinema verite will never will never give it to you, and and. Even documentary uh, fails. Yeah, and, and that's why in, in documentaries I always start to fabricate and right. I invent and I, uh, I use my fantasy and I, I, I start to fabricate and that those are, those are the moments that, that, that give the film a deeper dimension. I agree. But let's, <coughs> let's not speak about my movies. You are the one who is <laughs> out here <laughs> and exposed and you have to face it and you will have to face <laughs> a lot more <laughs> press and... Uh, you will probably be attacked by the am animal lovers <laughs> and you will be attacked by I don't know whom. So you have to face it and you have to fortify yourself with enough philosophy yeah. to uh, go through all this. But just... Yeah. Uh, Should we take some questions? No, yeah, I, j I just want, want, want to say one thing. As I'm a little bit older than you and I have uh, made a few films more, just, just never 
get scared of anything. Just, just do your things as you have to do it, period. <laughs> <laughs> Real, real hero. Should we? Yeah, let me, uh, anybody who has questions, why don't I jump in? And Burner the hero. <laughs> anybody have a question that they want to pass on? Any yeah. questions? Sir? Yeah, it was, there, there was a lot of life in there, and then it's good, yeah. Questions, anybody? <laughs> I apologize, but my housekeeping I neglected to tell you, we do have bathrooms, uh, men and women, down that hallway behind you and back down that way. So if you mm -hmm. will, that's what we do. Any other questions? Can I have some? I, I'll try to put some order into it because. To what end is your effort to capture truth? I think, uh, Harmony, we spoke What's about that? this. To, to what end is your effort to capture truth? I'll, um, I'll, it's um, not easy to answer. But I, that I can one. just say that, as far as that, I like actually like that question, just because I'll say that. This some people get angry at me for for this, but I don't think there's anything I wouldn't shoot. I mean, I think that if it compels me, and if it's something, I, an image I've never seen before, I'll shoot it. I don't care. I'll just, I want it, and um, I don't think I'm really scared. I mean, as far as it being scared, it's nothing of that. I'll just. I'll just if if it's something I really want, I'll get it. Or mm -hmm. if it's if it's something I've never seen, I won't I won't back away. I'll take it. Mm -hmm. uh, <coughs> Harmony, there is one question: How did someone from your generation develop a fascination for the Marx Brothers' work? Oh, um, I mean, I have a fascination for so much, you know. But um, the, <laughs> the Marx Brothers, I guess, my again, it goes to like just seeing their films really early, and like it's like Buster Keaton. Um, who I really, uh, who I love the most, I think is, he's pure cinema. His face to me is like, it burns off the screen. And, and the Marsh Brothers are like that. I just like the Marsh Brothers because I like the, the, the anarchy, the, the quality, that, uh, the wit, and, the, and just that they go against their, any kind of uh, formal sense of logic, or any kind of logic, period. And, but at the same time, there's something working there. And, and most of all, they're entertaining. Because I think it's like great art. To me, the best art works on two levels. It works on a kind of, the best art, you don't have to apply yourself. You know what I mean? It works on a, a kind of straight, kind of cerebral, cerebral um, level, and also like a intuitive. Yeah. There's one question about uh, <coughs> development of actors, uh, uh, Sanford, we what is his name? Wiesner, or can I read Weisner. this? Weisner. Uh, said it takes 20 years to become an actor, referring to both life experience and practice of this craft. Do you think the same applies to filmmakers as well? Not in your and case, because you're years. barely 20 years old. Right, I mean, I wrote so kids <laughs> at 18, so yeah. I don't see anything. I mean, I, I don't think, I think it's different for everyone. I think, I mean, do you, there's a, um, there's a, uh, there's a writer that her name is Daisy Ashford. I don't know if many people know who she is. She's a, she's a Victorian writer, and she wrote um, I think the greatest. No I mean, my favorite novel of all time is uh, Tristram Shandy, the Lawrence the Lawrence right. Stern novel. There's also a question about what what were your favorite books? Uh, uh, what did you read? Well, well, this this goes to the idea. Well, I love the, um, the Lawrence Stern novel, the Tristram Shandy. Yeah. But I think even better than that and more impressive is um, is Daisy Ashford. She was this great Victorian writer, and she wrote this. Um, she wrote her first classic, um, The Young Visitors, when she was nine years old. And um, it's not like a, it's not naif, it's like a mm -hmm. really, it's a really, like a, it's like a really smart book. It's like, it's like great literature. Yeah. It's really, um, so I mean, and she wrote her first book, uh, a guide on how to take care of pygmy, on, on uh, not pygmies, um, uh, ferrets or something like that when she was seven. So she's yeah. a great inspiration. Uh, let's go back to, uh, <laughs> to Lauren Stern. <coughs> this is very interesting because Lauren Stern is marked somehow the beginning of modern literature in s 1765 or so. Yeah. Uh, also, y you probably have read one of my favorite books of all time, uh, Sentimental Journey by La Ra Lauren Stern. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Of That's course. somehow the beginning of, of, that is of the modern beginning. storytelling. Yeah, yeah, he was the first. I mean, the, f the odd thing <coughs> about him, too, that is that he wasn't like most artists who are really kind of pushing things. He, w he wasn't like rejected. He was really like, uh, he was kind of 
he was grasped at the very beginning. He was kind of acknowledged as this kind of uh, yeah. this really which which genius. is odd because at that time literature was was completely different and 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 people when uh, Tristram Shandy was was published over I think monthly or uh, over right. a couple of years and whenever uh, a new uh, part of the story came out, people would walk out and and wait for the stagecoach to arrive yeah. and grab yeah. <coughs> grab the new part of the yeah. novel. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's just amazing. He was so a star. It's really rare. Yeah. But he was the first kind of really experimental literature. Yeah. And, and normally that doesn't happen to, to innovative things. That, that, that normally takes a long time until it, it catches on and, uh, and, and people start to understand and appreciate it. Yeah, no. So that was a very, very lucky man Yeah, somehow. it's very strange. I don't know how that happened. Like the Queen loved him, all the stuff. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, was there anything yeah. else like the question is adventure novels or science fiction? Or yeah. Um, so to cover that, I'm, I'm just referring to one of the questions out I here. Liked, um, I like, you know, S.J. Perlman. I like things like kind of, I, you know, I went through all these phases, you know, I went through tons of phases. Um, I like storytelling. I like uh, James Thurber and stuff like that. Uh -huh. and, um, just and basic about stories, simple. Also, uh, some question about movies. Uh, <coughs> for, for me, for example, I, uh, my greatest experience in movies was Dr. Fu Manchu. I hadn't seen films until I was 12. <laughs> I didn't know what movies was, and I made my first phone call at the age of 17. But <laughs> I, I saw some Tarzan films and some uh, uh, Zorro films, and, and one of the series of Dr. Fu Manchu. And I, all of a sudden, I realized, when I was 13 or so, I realized, or 14, I realized that in, in a battle of the bad guys, uh, of Dr. Fu Manchu and his henchmen and, 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 and the good guys, one got sh shot down from a rock and while he somersaults through the air and crashes to his death, does a strange little kick in mid-air. Two minutes later in the <laughs> same film, there's another battle and, and they recycled the shot. None of my friends, and they, they thought they would get away with it. it. It was probably a very, very cheap B or C picture. And they recycled the shot. And from that moment on, I realized how film was cheating and how film was, was organized. And, and I started to see films with, with new eyes yeah. and differently. And that, that somehow was my great experience. Was there anything like this for you, Dr. Fu Manchu's Tarzan oh. or whatever? Um, or science fiction films? Like the fir um, first movies. I mean... The very first movies that you remember. Can yeah. You? The first film I think what I saw was... Uh, my father told me that I really flipped out. I, th I think I was a real little baby. Was, I think it was called Harry and Tonto. Is that the name of a movie? Uh -huh. what, what is it all about? I don't know. Nurse. I can't, <laughs> I can't, I can't remember it. Um, yeah, there's like some cat, I think. Was it Cat Art Chase? Art. Yeah, Art Carney. Yeah, I think I was really upset about the cat or something happened. Um, the first movies that really changed my life, I guess, were kind of... Um, I guess it wasn't really like one film. It was like a gradual yeah, kind yeah. of thing. I just, you know... I mean, it, it's yeah. like strange because I can like I can only cite like there's no like there it's very rare to find a filmmaker who I who I can say I love you know like I love him I love it's like much more specific it's m more about kind of like certain works that really influenced me like mm -hmm. even dwarfs or Night of the Hunter or um, I don't know um, certain '70s films that I really liked and certain Fassbender films the first time I saw Godard. When I was when I was like 16, again that changed the way I thought about movies. That was r had such an impact on me. Mm -hmm. <coughs> there's there's one question which goes back into your own history uh, about kids. Did the way critics and press <coughs> kept labeling kids did you find that disturbing? Were you discouraged from making more films or breaking into directing as you do here? How did they label it? I don't know how, how it was labeled. Where, where, who, who wrote this question? Oh, yeah. What was the labeling of the, of the film? I, I do not read. Everything I kept reading, I was also everything I kept reading kept saying it was disturbing. I want to talk to someone. Hmm. Well, I mean, that's I fine. Know. Know. Yeah. yeah. I, mean, I think, I think Gamma well. will create a major problem for, <laughs> for, for reviewers and critics. And many of them will hate it because they will not be able to label it. So. You will run into some fire because 
Yeah, this uh, movie is more as long as, long as the critics gunmo. cannot label it, they are lost and they will start to hate it. Right, exactly, because gummo is much more difficult than kids as far for critics, especially because of that, because it kind of, it's a genre fuck. I go against, it, I go against any kind of, uh, any kind of genre or even logic, or not necessarily logic, but it just, it's just kind of, uh, it's just anytime you see, it's not a teen film, it's not this, it's not, th it's just a genre fuck, that's all I could say, you know? It's like, the best artist to me would do that, you know, the best artist fuck genre. So mm -hmm. it's a, a genre fucker. Yeah. <laughs> so. Harmony, there's, there's one question about audiences. Uh, uh, who do you want the audiences for your films to be? Do you think about this? It's really because I never think about, no, I've never had thought about the audience alive as, while I do things. I mean, while I'm making it. Um, I feel like the movie definitely is gonna, is most important, if it's most important that young people see the movie. I can really say that because it's like a, because it is like a new film and it's like a different way to watch movies, but at the same time it's like a, um, their kind of syntax, a younger kind of the way that um, images are presented and the way they've, that younger people are kind of, their sensibility, it's different. I think uh, there's just this, uh, there'll be like a different kind of, uh, under they'll, they'll like understand it maybe. Yeah. It'll be more important for them. I mean, I want whoever, you know, I think it's good. But whoever I think there's a natural audience it. for your films and that are the very young kids. That is probably the, the, the first yeah. the first thing that will come up because you are the voice of, of, of the of the very young generation and there's well, no I doubt about it. I know, I mean someone someone said that. Someone said that I was a voice of a generation, but I don't feel like I'm I can ever be a voice I'm I'm much too um, I'm just the voice of harmony, I think. Because yeah. like <laughs> it's my voice is much too um, uh, kind of like um, much more too much mm -hmm. it's just too per it's much more personal and obsessive. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's a, like like Gummo is just a. It's like I wanted to create like a cinema of obsession and a cinema of kind of um, of, uh, of 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 just that kind of. Um, when people say you're, that I've like heard people say it was self indulgent, but I don't understand. I don't that I don't know what that means even because how could to me the idea of artwork not being or an, uh, being self indulgent or an artist who is who is doing work that's not from inside it's. It's uh, it's like false. It's just it's mm -hmm. shit. That's like what I, why I hate films now, because it's more like trying to appeal to this like kind of like yeah. this like really generic. What I don't understand that. I want to yeah. like you know work my pr you know I want to just. How many? Let me let me ask a, a tricky question, which uh, is hard to answer. But what what do you see at the horizon for yourself? Mm. What where are you moving to, to towards? Where are you moving? Mm. I've been thinking about that too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, it's it's. No. Um. I'm just gonna keep the thing is like I'm just gonna keep like ex I think I'm just gonna keep pushing things. I mean, but at the same time, like I'm I'm not like after Gummo, I think that that people will think I'm a, a certain way, you know. Um. But I want to like it's, I'm gonna do. I mean, I'll do films that are completely, totally narrative and traditional and completely linear. I mean, my movies will never be like. You know, but at the same time, uh, I'm just gonna go against everything I said. I guess I'm just gonna keep on experimenting. I want to do stuff with like hitting cameras and shoot films. With, you know, I just want to do. I just want to make movies differently. I just want to keep pushing the form. There's no one that's pushing anything. It's like it's like a. It's really dead to me now. Even the films that people like, I think, are dead. And the same uh, probably applies for for what you are writing. Right. Yeah. I want to. Yeah. Right, the, the great novel with pages missing in all the right places. Yeah. 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 How many? I, I wish that uh, that you will continue without being ever afraid. And I wish uh, every man for himself. That you will and God against all. <laughs> 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 and I, I wish that you make a uh, release a great novel. I'm waiting for the writer. I'm waiting for the writer, Harmony Corinne, and I'm waiting for the filmmaker, <laughs> Harmony Corinne. Thank right. you very much. <laughs> <laughs>